certainly nice to be back here in Sydney. It's uh, at least as nice as I remember it from the past. Uh, it's great to see everyone. And it's uh, certainly an honor to be invited to uh, speak here to the IGS workshop. This is, in my opinion, one of the, the best conferences around in this field. So th that's quite nice. Uh, so yesterday, we had a very nice uh, presentation on low-cost receivers for mass market applications and the, the exciting things that are coming up in that field. Uh, so they, today, we'll mix that up and talk about expensive receivers that are not used for mass market applications. So these are, we are not uh, launching, uh, a, you know, smartphones into space just yet, but uh, you never know in a, in a decade or two. Uh, so these receivers are, uh, are you know, dual frequency, high precision receivers that are mounted on spacecraft that are in low Earth orbit. They have at least two antennas, one or more looking upwards, and then one or more looking sidewards. And uh, the, the precise measurements that they provide are used to uh, back out information about the atmosphere that they travel through going from the GNSS transmitters down to the receiver on the LEO uh, satellite. And together with uh, you know, a lot of fancy algorithms and careful processing, you can back out uh, a number of physical properties related to the atmosphere that those signals have traveled through. And the applications are, uh, are uh, you know, in, are really quite important. They, this, uh, this, these data sets are used in weather prediction. They're used in climate and space weather science. And I think uh, at some level everyone benefits because I, I think we can all agree that a good uh, valuable uh, forecast is, you know, that's accurate over a long time is, is very useful, especially when it comes to extreme weather events. Uh, so the title of the talk is GNSS Radio Occultation Science and Applications. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Rick Antes, John Brown, Bill Quo, Bill Schreiner, and Sergei Sokolovsky, all in, uh, in the Cosmic Group. So uh, an outline of the talk, I'll, I'll just spend one slide about the organization. It uh, is maybe not so familiar to all of the IGS. We'll take a brief survey of the radio occultation technique uh, at, a, at a fairly high level. We'll discuss some of the radio occultation missions that uh, are flying now and have flown in the past. We'll show some sample results about the, uh, on the impacts of radio occultation data on weather prediction. So that's something uh, we can all relate to, I think. And then we'll get to some of the really fun stuff. Uh, a lot of the, uh, we'll talk about the, the work going on for Cosmic 2, which is a, a new mission launching uh, in about a year. And to finish up, I'll talk about the, the, the very important interfaces that the RO community has with the IGS uh, products and services. All right, so uh, just a little bit about UCAR. It's the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. So as the name implies, they do research about the atmosphere. It's a consortium of uh, about 100 uh, North American universities. Uh, this consortium was founded in 1960 to uh, create and manage the National Center for Atmospheric Research which is located in Boulder. Uh, it's a fairly a reasonable size organization, 1,500 staff, about half, a little more than half of those are scientists and engineers. The work they do is uh, more focused on science, uh, big computational and observational systems, big data sets related to the atmosphere, oceans, the sun, and so on. So a lot of, uh, of high-end processing going on. Uh, one of the buildings that's uh, kind of a landmark in the area is the, the Mesa Lab here. If you ever get there, there's a nice uh, ex exhibit area and also there are good hiking trails. Uh, they do fly, uh, they manage and fly a couple of airplanes. One is a C-130, it's a fairly large transport aircraft and also this Gulf Stream there. So of course it's now a goal of mine to, to fly that, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, the Cosmic Program is, is a group within UCAR, it's about 25 staff, scientists, engineers, IT people, programmers and support staff. And the expertise in the group spans a fairly wide range from uh, ground and space-based GNSS processing to radio occultation, of course, spacecraft integration and testing, and then on the, on the backside, the atmospheric space weather and climate science. All right, so, uh, so just a, a simple sentence about radio occultation. It's just a technique that looks at the bending of radio waves as they traverse an atmosphere. And, you know, there are a lot of details there, and, uh, but it's not a very new technique. Uh, so it was used in the 1960s to look at planetary atmospheres uh, by some teams at JPL and Stanford uh, with the Mariner 4 mission. So, uh, you know, they looked at a couple of planets at the time. Closer to Earth, uh, this is a picture of the, the technique. So uh, we're going to take advantage of the GNSS transmitters. We have LEOs flying around the Earth with receivers that are looking you know, as I mentioned, have these uh, forward and aft side-looking antennas that are receiving the signals 
from the GNSS transmitters uh, as they go through the atmosphere. And when they do that, they, they bend, right? So if it were going through a vacuum, it would be a straight line. But it isn't a vacuum, so you, uh, you get bending of the signal, uh, some extra path delay and a bending angle. And from that, you can back out physical properties about the atmosphere. The, the key ones are uh, pressure and temperature, also information about humidity. Uh, and of course, you're also looking at the ionosphere, so that's uh, an, another area. OK, so uh, just a kind of a cartoon to, to illustrate this a little bit further. Uh, so, so this is a picture of Cosmic 2. I'll have some more details on that later. Uh, you can see here, so the POD antenna, there's actually two of them. And they're, they're sort of upward looking. They're not right on top, uh, as, as is typically done for POD. And the reason for that is that they want a picture of the ionosphere as well. So there's one that's tilted in one direction and one that's tilted in the other direction uh, for ionospheric sounding as well as uh, the, the POD. Then there's a phased array antenna. So this is a, a, fa a, a high gain an antenna that points high gain at the limb of the Earth. And then here you're looking at signals that are coming from the side. They're traveling through an atmosphere. Uh, and then this is the radio occultation processing. So the data types you, you get from these, uh, on the POD antennas, it's, it's pretty much what we're used to in the geodetic community, pseudo range, carrier phase, SNR, typically at a one hertz rate uh, on, on at least two frequencies. Um, now on, on the side here, this is done a little bit differently. This is still dual frequency data. But now we're tracking uh, in an open loop mode, which means we're, we're really uh, getting I's and Q's or phase and amplitude uh, measurements. And, and one key factor here is that those measurements still contain the navigation data message bits that are transmitted on the GNSS signal. So whenever that bit changes, the carrier phase flips by 180 degrees. And you have to undo that on the ground in the, in the ground processing uh, to do the occultation uh, retrievals. So you, you do need a ground network. Uh, which is uh, illustrated there. For a couple of things, you have to have good orbits and clocks for the GNSS transmitters. So you, you do that with the ground network. You also need uh, fairly high rate clocks. I'll talk about that uh, in a bit. And you also uh, need the navigation bits uh, in, in a raw format. So we're used to Rhinex files that have decoded these. Uh, but for this kind of processing, when you do the occultation uh, retrievals, you, you need to remove those bits um, on the ground. So uh, just a few, uh, a list here of characteristics of RO data. We'll just highlight a few. It will come as no surprise that you get global coverage. We're used to that in, in GNSS. You get profiles of the ionosphere, stratosphere, and troposphere. The, the temperature accuracy that you retrieve from these measurements is very good. It's on average about a tenth of a Kelvin uh, with a high precision that is listed there. So it's, it's a really nice uh, thermometer, is, uh, as we'll mention in, in a couple of slides. Uh, you get pretty high resolution, so the occultation geometry, right, will can start can start high or low. But let's say it's a, it's a setting occultation; it might set, start high in the atmosphere, and then you track the occultation for a minute or two. And as the relative geometry changes, you go down into lower parts of the troposphere where the signal is traversing the atmosphere. Just like GNSS navigation, the technique works in any kind of weather, uh, and there are no significant effects from clouds or you know rain or snow; those kinds of things. In terms of ionosphere, uh, typically you get absolute TEC uh, at the level of 1 to 3 TEC units. Relative TEC is a little bit better. There's no calibration that's needed. That's a, that's a very nice thing. Uh, we'll, we'll see later that some other atmospheric sounders uh, have biases, for example. And they actually use radio occultation data these days to calibrate some of those techniques. So that's, that's very nice. It's also uh, becoming a climate benchmark. So there's a tie to SI standards. Uh, and the time series of radio occultation data from space is uh, getting to be about 20 years long now. And it's not continuous, but the first satellite doing this was GPS-MET. And that started providing data in 2000, uh, 1996. All right. So I mentioned already some of the scientific uses. But the, I think uh, one, of, one of the big ones is obviously weather. So all the major weather centers in the world now assimilate radio occultation data. And they use that in their forecast. And uh, it's particularly useful in the southern hemisphere and over the oceans, which, which is not dissimilar to what we see with uh, geodetic data from uh, GNSS data, because uh, again, it's hard to put sensors uh, in the ocean and uh, in uh, remote areas. Ionosphere and space weather, that's a whole other area. And as I was just mentioning, climate. And uh, I think uh, a lot of these, the eminent scientists in this field agree that radio occultation does provide the best 
uh, you know, accurate, precise, and, and stable thermometer from space. All right, so we'll talk about the RO processing uh, at a fairly high level, so I'll, I'll get into some of these in a, in a little bit more detail. But uh, as I mentioned, we start with the open loop data coming off the side-looking antennas on, on these LEOs. So that's phase and amplitude. Next, uh, the next important step is that you have to calculate what's called an excess phase, and you can think of this as just the extra path delay. If the signal travels through a vacuum, it'll take a straight line because it's going through the atmosphere. It bends. There's a longer path length. So, so to get this, you have to know the location of the receiving and the transmitting phase centers. And of course, you want to know those as well as possible. So that's uh, near and dear to the, uh, a lot of the IGS community. Here we're doing you know, orbit determination both for the transmitters and the receivers. So the excess phase then goes into a bending angle uh, calculation. I'll have a slide on that. Um, and that, that's basically telling us the angle of, of the bending of the signal. From that, you, you do some more processing, and you get to refractivity. And that's uh, basically density of the air, and that relates to pressure, temperature, water vapor, and also the ionosphere. So uh, from, from that quantity, you can then go to, to the, the usual uh, things, that physical properties that, that people are, are uh, familiar with. So the, the bending angle, uh, just this is a geometric uh, optics representation, is, is this guy here. We have a straight line signal here. It gets bent. And then we have a receiver over here, and the bending angle is this quantity right there. So this technique is uh, useful in the upper troposphere and above. It uh, doesn't work that well as you go uh, further down. Uh, and in the last decade or so, wave optics-based techniques have really taken over there. So, but we won't talk about them. They're, they're not nearly as nice to explain. Uh, and a, as I mentioned, you know, to, to get to this, you do need precise knowledge of the transmitter and receiver locations. Now, what you, what you really uh, go through here is a little bit of math that relates the Doppler shift, which we measure with GNSS, to the bending angle in this picture here. And I won't go through that. But one, one interesting point uh, in, in this uh, RO community is that they worry a little bit more about velocity than they do the positions of the transmitters because they're dealing with Doppler shifts. Now, uh, you know, of course, you want to know both position and velocity. They're, they're related uh, as accurately as possible. But if you have some position errors in your orbits, and if they are approximately a bias over the course of an occultation, which might be a minute or two, uh, they actually don't matter that much because they're differencing data throughout that occultation. So that's, that's interesting. Um, but again, of course, you, know, you, you do want to do the best job you can. So the next step from, uh, from these bending angles is you do some processing involving an able inversion, and this gets fairly complicated. And you end up with refractivity, which is the quantity n over here. And as you can see, uh, refractivity now relates to pressure, to pressure, temperature, water vapor, as well as the ionospheric contribution. So generally, you process dual frequency combinations to remove uh, at least to first order the ionospheric effects. And then uh, you have this, this quantity. And the, you know, this is where now, you, now, of course, you want to work out, well, what are the contributions of the P and P? And uh, you know, that's where a topic that's familiar to a lot of people here comes in, you know, is that they're running filters, you know, either filters smoother or batch filters in, in these models to, to back out these, these particular contributions. Uh, the, the operational weather centers actually tend to ingest bending angle, which is the previous step. Uh, and then they do this internally. They go to refractivity. And then from there, they go to these different quantities. And that's really, uh, you know, and how that's done, you know, people spend their careers on that. And also, it's, it's kind of the special sauce. You know, they don't necessarily, you know, it's different from center to center. And they don't always want to tell you how they, how they do that. And as you ima imagine, it gets very complicated. How, how you do this in detail depends on whether you're in a dry region versus the tropics, things like that. So, so that's just a, a quick overview. So, uh, so something relating back to orbits and clocks. So uh, the clocks are actually really important. You can. If you have clock errors, either on the receiver side or on the GNSS transmitter side, you can map that analytically into the bending angles. And that's, of course, the quantity that is then used in the weather models and also for climate and so on. So you know, knowing the clocks is, is really key. So there's a couple of ways you can process the data. You can use undifferenced measurements. So you have to assume that you have estimated the, the receiver clock and the transmitter clocks perfectly, and you just use those parameters. Uh, that works pretty well uh, as long as the receiver clock is stable. So, for example, MEDOP is a European mission. They have a very nice clock on board. That technique is used. 
Typically, for uh, most of the satellites that don't have quite as nice of a receiver clock, you need to do something to remove that contribution. So single differencing is a, is a, you know, a, a standard approach for that. So you take a reference satellite that's coming in off the POD antenna, which is not occulting, and you difference the data with the uh, occulting signal. Of course, you have to be careful about the, the phase center geometry and so on. Uh, but if you do that right, then you've removed the effect of the receiver clock. So you still feed in the transmitter clock, and, and you trust it as a known parameter. You can also do double difference processing uh, together with the station on the ground. Uh, and that's, for example, something that was done with GPS-MET, the first mission. Back in those days, uh, selective availability was on. You just didn't have, and you didn't have as big of a ground network. So you just didn't know the transmitter clocks as well. So you, you wanted to remove both, both clocks. All right, so, uh, so a few uh, words about the existing missions. There's, there's quite a few. I'll have a table here in a little bit. Uh, one of them is, of course, Cosmic One. This is um, a U.S.-Taiwan joint project that was launched in 2006. It consists of six satellites. Uh, here's a picture of them from a, a, journal, artic, a journal cover. They, uh, they're sort of these round little pizzas with wings, if you, if you will. And um, they have side-looking radio occultation antennas and also two uh, patch antennas for the POD. So they fly a blackjack GPS receiver. That's, that's the primary in instrument. There are also some ionospheric uh, sensors. And then we get these quantities here that, that we've already mentioned uh, from that on a, on a global, global scale. It was a fairly cheap mission, I think, on the order of 120 million or so for six satellites. So in, in this business, that's, that's not too much. Uh, and it was a two-year mission plan. So, uh, you know, and actually two of the satellites currently are still operating. So it's been more than 10 years. And up until recently, there were three and four. So uh, it, it's done quite well. This is a map uh, when, when they, all the spacecraft are working. Here, the green dots show where you might uh, have, typically on a typical day, occultation measurements. So you can see you get really nice coverage. The spacecraft are in a 72-degree inclination orbit. In the red, there are, uh, underneath the green, are dots that represent where uh, various agencies take radioson measurements. So these are you know, balloons with sensors that you send up from the ground. Uh, and th those are pretty important contributions to the, to the weather models. And as I was looking at this, I thought, well, you know, that if, if you imagine away the green dots and just uh, sort of in your mind leave the reds, that looks pretty similar to the ground network in GS GNSS, actually. And basically for the same reasons, right? It's, uh, you have, uh, in the southern hemisphere, you have remote areas, you have a lot of water. It's not that easy to put ground sensors up. So in a, in a sense, that's, that's something in common with the geodesy community. So Cosmic One uh, has provided now more than 6 million radio occultation profiles from all those satellites. So that's uh, very, very nice. Uh, this is a plot of, up, up through January. So we can see at the beginning, of course, we had the most uh, occultations. Sort of on the best days, you were up at around 3,000 per day. Uh, and then re more recently, the, the set, this constellation has been declining, right? It's getting quite old, unsurprisingly. So we're down to uh, a few hundred, five or 800 uh, occultations per day at the moment. Uh, but they're doing a good job managing these satellites. And, uh, you know, the, their function depends a bit on the beta angle of the orbits right now, uh, just because the batteries aren't charging as nicely as, as they used to. So that's just, just the, uh, the equipment aging. So here is a list of all the occultation missions that have been processed over time uh, at UCAR. So uh, we, there was a nice uh, bent, you know, uh, crossing of the 10 million mark recently. So we're up at uh, about 10 million and uh, oh, about close to 100,000 above that. So of course, most of those occultations come from uh, Cosmic One. But other missions too, MetUp in particular, uh, Grace and, and Champ and so on, have contributed a lot of data uh, over time. So. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, underneath this, there's quite a bit of POD work that has to go on to, uh, to process these missions. So the, the data processing at UCAR is done uh, as part of something called the, data, the Cosmic Data Analysis and Archive Center, or the CDAC. Uh, and this is a fairly complex and large computing system now that really handles most aspects of this data processing. So it handles scheduling downlinks at the ground stations, you know, orbit predictions that are related to that level zero to level one, two, and three processing, quality control, monitoring, product delivery, and data archiving. So it's quite an extensive system. Uh, that has been in progress since the late 1990s. And uh, you know, in, um, 
And it's, it's not officially an operational system uh, just yet, but uh, it has been run essentially as one since Cosmic One came about in 2006. So that's when the system started delivering products to all the global weather centers. And the availability has been uh, you know, quite good, I'd say, uh, for something that's quasi-operational. It has been running at one data center up to now, so that's, that's a big thing that's changing here for Cosmic 2. Uh, and you, know, you can see there are a lot of users in, in many countries of the data. So just a high-level diagram of the things that go on. So this is kind of a, a left-to-right uh, picture. So we have here data coming down from the LEO satellites. Here are some stations used for Cosmic 1. This network is, is uh, a bit more complex for Cosmic 2. And then we have a lot uh, of other inputs. Uh, some really key ones are GNSS ground data. So you have to use that for both the GNSS transmitter orbit and clock determination as well as the, the navigation bits. Uh, there are orbit products that are used from the IGS. So those are, are highly valuable. There are some uh, weather model forecasts and things that go in. And then all the, all the processing here, the LEO POD, the GNSS clock determination, and then the atmospheric processing, which is really a you know, huge part of it, is going on here. And then the products are distributed to various places. Our partners in Taiwan, the research community, uh, the Air Force Weather Agency, their archives. And, uh, and then here, NOAA NESDIS uh, runs a system called the GTS, the Global uh, Telecommunication System. And the bending angle products go there. And once they're there, they're open and public. So anyone can pick them up and use them. And they go on to, you know, here's a list, and it's probably not complete, but all the major weather agencies in the world. And they, you know, they very successfully use the data. All right, so, uh, so the impacts of the data. Well, they're, they're pretty important, and there are, you know, just probably hundreds of studies that show useful impacts. So I, I just picked some that uh, my colleagues recommended. Uh, one thing uh, here is uh, this is a time series of uh, model temperature and measured temperature uh, based on radio sounds in the southern hemisphere in the ECMWF processing. And this is in 2006. So this is before the Cosmic 1 data were used. And then we see this big step function here. And we roughly see the bias go away once the radio occultation data are assimilated. So that's great, of course. And that illustrates that you know, there, there's no calibration or biases specific to the RO data. However, there are biases in some of the other atmospheric sounders, and the RO data can be used to correct those. So this was a very nice result early on in the mission. So uh, people at various centers have done studies of uh, the impact of the RO data on forecasting errors or reductions in forecasting errors. That's what the uh, x-axis is showing there. And there are, of course, many data types that are assimilated. These are huge, complicated models running on supercomputers. Uh, so they ingest millions of observations in, a, in a, any given day. Uh, so people have done studies. This is one from 2011 done at ECMWF, the European Center for Medium Weather Forecast, uh, that looked at you know, withholding data from different techniques uh, and looking at the forecast. And we can see the ARCO, RO contribution, let me see if I can find my pointer here, is certainly in the top five. Uh, you know, and in fact, there are, you know, these, these four uh, measurement types are roughly tied. Uh, so that's, that's about 10% reduction in forecast error, although the, the amount of data from RO is only 2 or 3% of the, the whole data set that they ingest. So it's a you know, very valuable data type. Another study uh, from the US, the National Center for Environmental Prediction, uh, did something similar this time in 2010. And they showed uh, on the left here, we, we have a similar plot, reduction in forecast error, slightly different unit there. But we can see this is the top five, in the top five of the measurement types. If you normalize this by the number of observations that are contributed, we, we make it to number three. So it's a high impact uh, system uh, in, in these weather models. So uh, this is a result that uh, is currently being, uh, you know, uh, getting, getting ready for publication by some uh, colleagues of mine, Bill Kuo and Xu Ya Chen. They've been looking at, uh, they've been running a, a weather model at NCAR called the uh, WRF, uh, Weather Research and Forecast Model, or WARF. Uh, and they've been looking at, uh, you know, higher fidelity uh, use of the RO data in moist regions where you're prone to cyclone genesis. So they've been looking at a particular hurricane, among other things, uh, called NURI in 2008. This started in uh, roughly the central Pacific and, and moved west past the Philippines towards Taiwan and China. Uh, and the operational models at the time did not uh, do a good job predicting uh, the genesis of this typhoon. Uh, and so uh, they've been working on uh, some more higher fidelity ways 
to ingest the data. So this is just a movie on the left showing the, the original prediction without the RO data. And on the right, we, we do use more of the RO data in a higher fidelity way. <coughs> and you can already see you know, something uh, sort of happening there on the right and, and not so much on the left. And as this movie progresses, you'll see this prediction uh, you know, showing the, the typhoon quite nicely. So now you can really see the, the oscillations there. Uh, you know, other studies have looked at using RO data for predicting the hurricane paths, what kind of impact is there. Uh, one study I, I reviewed uh, recently uh, showed about a 20 to 25 percent improvement in predicting the track of the hurricane, which is obviously of great societal benefit. All right, so now to some of the more uh, fun stuff. Uh, so Cosmic 2. So we've been really busy with this. Cosmic 2 is a, a follow-on mission to Cosmic 1, uh, clearly. Uh, this is uh, still a, US, uh, a joint U.S.-Taiwan project. NSPO is the National Space Organization in Taiwan. UCAR is involved, it's quite interesting, is involved in, in a lot of areas of this, from um, project management to spacecraft integration and testing, to the data processing, to the ground network, uh, and even import-export issues and, and so on and so forth, so, uh, and launch vehicles. So it's quite an interesting time. Uh, you know, it's also a busy time because the launch is, is uh, in the first quarter of 2017, so there's a, a lot of activity going on. Um, so this, uh, the, normally this is two sets of six satellites, so the first set is launching in about a year. These are, this is six satellites going into a 24-degree inclination orbit, so the reason for that is uh, they want to look at the, the, the tropics, basically. So Taiwan obviously has a strong interest in that uh, because of the, the typhoons that they're affected by. The, what they call the polar constellation will normally launch uh, around 2019, so this will be a 72-degree inclination orbit. This is not fully funded at the moment, so uh, you know, hopefully that will happen in the next year or so. This, uh, so there's a GNSS payload, which is uh, the follow-on to the blackjack, the, the TRIG or Tri-GNSS receiver from JPL. There are uh, two, now there are better antennas, there are two choke rings, These are, we'll have a picture in a minute, they're side-looking, two-phased array antennas for a higher gain towards the limb of the Earth. And it will track, uh, for sure at first, both GPS and GLONASS, and it's, it's probably going to be the first public data set uh, tracking GLONASS from space. Uh, there are some, some satellites up there the Russians have, but I, I don't think they share the data. Uh, so we will expect something on the more than 10,000 occultations a day. So if you remember Cosmic 1, uh, in the best of times, was providing about 3,000 occultations. So this will be roughly a, a, you know, more than a factor of three of that. And uh, you know, that's thanks to using both of the, the constellations. There are some secondary payloads related to the ionosphere. There's also a small uh, retro reflector to do a little bit of orbit validation. Uh, it's a, compared to Cosmic 1, it's a much nicer spacecraft. So it's a, it's a bus provided by Surrey, weighs about 300 kilograms. There are star cameras, sun sensors, three-axis stabilization. So in terms of POD, this should be a, a pretty good platform. Uh, and certainly the attitude knowledge will be good, uh, and the control will be good as well. So that, that's great. Um, so five satellites are done. Uh, this is a, a picture of one of them in, in one of the assembly buildings. Uh, the sixth one is uh, nearly done. I had the pleasure of uh, getting to see them up close last week. That, that was quite fun. Um, they'll be launching on a Falcon Heavy rocket uh, from uh, SpaceX uh, from the Kennedy Space Center. And um, so Taiwan will be managing all the on-orbit satellite operations. The, the initial orbit is 800 kilometers high, and then over about 18 months, they'll drop one at a time down to the final orbit of five, 520 to 550. And so every, every couple of months, uh, they start repositioning one at a time. This is a picture of the, the GPS receiver box. You can't see much, but it's, uh, it's good stuff. So here's a, a detailed picture of the spacecraft. Here are the, the POD antennas. Uh, there's two of them looking sideways. These are choke rings. Again, they're, you know, normally you would want to just put one on top that looks at zenith, but uh, in order to do the ionospheric sensing, you, you, you want these side-looking antennas. And um, the radio occultation antenna is, of course, uh, this guy here. Uh, this is the ion velocity meter, uh, and then down below there's an RF beacon and also the uh, retro reflector. So. so in terms of the coverage, so uh, from the first set, you'll get a lot of uh, occultations in, in the lower latitudes, the, um, as expected. So up to about 40 degrees latitude, you'll, you'll see occultations. 
uh, you know, using both uh, GPS and GLONASS constellations. Of course, that fills in, uh, you know, very nicely once you, once you have both sets of satellites. All right, so, uh, yeah, we're pretty swamped preparing for this. There's a lot of work going on. I'll just highlight a few little things. So GPS plus GLONASS capability is, of course, uh, a big one. And the other one is low latency processing. So uh, for Cosmic One and some of the other missions, you're looking at neutral atmosphere product latencies of, that total up to 70 to 90 minutes on, on average. Uh, and the requirement here is a 30-minute uh, latency. So that, that actually drives a, a lot of work on the ground segment to make sure you pass over ground stations at uh, regular intervals. Uh, it also drives, uh, you know, the GNSS processing because we need the clocks and also the orbits. Uh, so we're currently looking at a uh, 10-minute cadence for 30-second clocks. So every 10 minutes you kick it off, and a couple of minutes later you have estimates uh, going back over those 10 minutes, you know, and, and further as well. Uh, there's, you know, as I mentioned, the, um, the clock errors map into the bending angles, which are the quantity that the weather centers ingest. So you want those to be as small as possible. And it turns out we've been looking at higher rate clocks than 30 seconds. In particular, for GLONASS, it looks like we may have to go to an interval that is smaller than, than 30 seconds. So the GPS clocks tend to be pretty good that if you do a piecewise linear interpolation between the, the 30 second estimates, that works nicely uh, and has, of course, worked nicely in the past. But for GLONASS, it looks like we may have to go down to smaller intervals. And I, I kind of hope that interval is bigger than one second, but that's, uh, that's work that's underway. Uh, on the IT side, there are a lot of things going on. So all the processing in the past has been done at the Mesa Lab, which I showed a picture of earlier there. Uh, so now that's going to be the backup data center with an operational stream going, as well as the development systems. Uh, and all the main computing will be done about 100 miles north at a supercomputing center here, also run by NCAR. And uh, here we'll have two operational strings. And the idea is, of course, that one of those strings is more likely to go down than the whole data center. So, you know, if you're going to put two somewhere, you might as well put them at this very nice facility, which has redundant power and internet connections and direct fiber connections back to Mesa and so on. So this is a very nice, uh, nice setup they, they have there. All right. All right, so back to uh, some topics that are uh, familiar to the, to the IGS, the ground network. As I mentioned, you have to do GNSS processing for GPS and GLONASS, so I already talked through that more or less. Uh, and a key component is the navigation data message. So, uh, you know, a lot of us are used to the decoded nav files that are provided in RINEX format, but for the open loop processing, you have to remove the raw bits that are, that are coming down on, on the transmitted signals. So, uh, so that's, that's an important data type. There's a bit, bit of a niche data type, uh, certainly in the uh, precision community. Uh, we're t using uh, real-time data now. Again, the latency is driving that. So in the past, the people have used 15-minute or hourly RINEX files. So now it's going to entrap, entrap in specific receiver formats. Uh, we're also uh, in the process of installing uh, a set of GNSS receivers uh, together with partners around the world. Um, so these are replacing uh, something, they, a legacy network they call the BitGrabber network. It's also being expanded. It's about a dozen sites. Uh, and, you know, those are all going in uh, hopefully by the end of this year. Uh, so these are geodetic receivers, triple frequency receivers, tracking all the systems, you know, and uh, they should be mostly geodetic quality uh, installations. So, uh, so as these sites come up and as the data are validated, you know, we'll be very happy to provide the data to the IGS, both uh, wherever we can as real-time streams and files. So as long as the comms allow that. We'll be, uh, we'll be doing that, and we'll be talking to the appropriate uh, people here to get these sites uh, into the systems. Something, uh, something just kind of fun. This is not a GNSS site. This is a little bit bigger. This is a, uh, a downlink site that uh, we did uh, fairly recently up here in Darwin in Australia, together with the, uh, uh, well, NOAA and the uh, Australian Bureau of Meteorology. So this is a 3.7-meter uh, downlink dish. It's, this is actually also used for uplink uh, that was installed, so that, that's a fun project. And uh, since we're here in Australia and on this slide, we do want to point out the, you know, the contributions of both the BOM and Geoscience Australia have been really fantastic. They're uh, you know, can-do can -do people that are uh, willing to help, so that's been uh, really nice to, to have this partnership. All right. So we'll finish up. Uh, 
you know, we've alluded to various interfaces to the IGS, so I'll, I'll try to summarize that and, and highlight the, you know, the important contributions of this community and some of the things that we can feed back uh, to it. So uh, this is, again, kind of a high-level diagram of the processing that goes on. As you might expect, the atmospheric community you know, spends their time down here on the excess phase processing, the geometric and wave optics, and all that is, you know, this is high, highly complicated stuff that uh, people spend, you know, many years uh, working on and improving. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's naturally where the focus is. But you can't do any of that without these pieces that are up above. So the arrows kind of show the dependencies. And, you know, up at the top we have GNSS transmitter orbits and clocks. Well, that involves, oh, the ITRF, that involves their orientation parameters, receiver clocks, uh, station positions, tropospheres, and, and all of that, right? So that's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a key ingredient, uh, you know, without which you can't do anything. Then we have LEO orbit and clock estimation. So this, you know, we're doing pretty standard reduced dynamics uh, approaches for that. Uh, but again, you know, you, you, you know that's a, a topic that is, um, you know, actively worked on here by, by portions of the IGS community. Um, and, uh, yeah, so you, you know, so that's all pretty important. Down here, again, we have the, the nav bits. So you need ground data up here uh, as well as down here. It's uh, separated. But the nav bits come into the atmospheric processing. So that, that gets right into the ground infrastructure. So just summarizing that in, uh, in some words, uh, you know, the IGS community and the contributing agencies, you know, contribute critical pieces here. So we have orbits and clocks and EOPs. We, uh, have GNSS observations. Obviously, you need those, the raw observations. We need access to the ITRF. The IGS products are a very nice uh, way of, of accessing that. Uh, and of course, the products are also used in, in various research studies, you know, by uh, centers all around the world. So, uh, so I, you know, in, in closing, I'll just say that, you know, we're happy to engage further with the IGS here in the future. As I mentioned, we'll be uh, contributing the, G, the GNSS observations. Uh, we'd also like to work with the IGS to finalize uh, some formats for uh, an archive of navigation bit files uh, that, uh, you know, we, we certainly have and some other people have. And, uh, it, you know, it's, as I mentioned, that's a niche product, but we may as well uh, archive that for the community. And uh, so we'll be happy to work with, with this group to, uh, to finish up a little bit of work on that. Uh, also, uh, you know, I talked about a lot of work that's going on for COSMIC-2, so part of that is uh, improved clock processing, orbit processing. We also do a lot of troposphere processing, ground-based troposphere processing. Uh, so we're pretty busy right now, but as these things are spun up and validated and finalized, you know, we'll again be talking to the various people here that are appropriate in the IGS community to contribute those products back. And, uh, you know, so we hope that will be a valuable, a valuable thing. Um, so finally, uh, just a, a big slide here of, uh, you know, illustrating that this is very much a collaborative effort. Uh, I think it's, it's, you know, very much in the spirit of the IGS that a lot of agencies and institutes from around the world here are getting together and contributing to a, a technical challenge that is beneficial to, uh, you know, significant portions of the world, really. So that's, that's great. So, uh, so I'll leave it with that. And, uh,